Today's episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Witch Baby Soap. Do you like to dwell in the shadows but stay squeaky clean? Then Witch Baby Soap is the soap for you. They make fabulous occult-themed body products like coffin-shaped bath balms, tarot card soap, and crystal-embedded body butters. Their recipes are made with magical intentions, and they're free of all of those nasty things like sulfates and parabens. And now, you can get 15% off orders using offer code WITCHWAVE. That's WITCHWAVE, one word, on witchbabysoap.com. So get ready to wind down, lather up, and get some Witch Baby Soap products using offer code WITCHWAVE now. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by The Pretty Cult. The Pretty Cult is an apparel brand with a love of tarot, the occult, and of course, all things rock and roll that are put into every piece created. All Pretty Cult items are sewn, screen printed, and handmade in the House of Cult in Los Angeles, California, which is a woman-owned and operated shop. And now, you can shop the Pretty Cult's new brick-and-mortar location in Santa Clarita, California, located inside the Old World Emporium. Best of all, you can take 15% off your first online order with code WITCHWAVE. So go ahead and check out The Pretty Cult and use offer code WITCHWAVE for 15% off your first order. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Kate's Magic Intention-Based Aromatherapy. Kate's Magic makes 100% pure aromatherapeutic grade essential oils combined with the highest quality ingredients, blended during sacred ritual and charged with the healing power of Reiki and intention. All of Kate's Magic products are hand blended in small batches with love and mindfulness by a staff comprised of Reiki practitioners who holds the intention of each product throughout the entire production process. Kate's Magic's aromatherapy provokes the senses, conjures wisdom, and calls forth peace, love, and trust to support people on their life path in order to invoke positive changes by uniting the power of intention with the beautiful aromas of Earth's sacred and medicinal plants. Kate's Magic carries anointing oils, which are perfect for setting daily intentions, Aura mists for instant energetic shifts, and exotic, all-natural perfumes inspired by the ancient Egyptian art of perfuming. Diffuser oils, single-note essential oils, body lotions, and more magical tools for rituals. They are a woman-owned and woman-operated business in historic downtown Tucson, Arizona, and which we listeners can receive 10% off with offer code WITCH. So go on ahead to katesmagic.com. That's K-A-T-E-S-M as in magic, A-G-I-K. And use offer code WITCH for 10% off. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. I hope you had a very happy Halloween and a blessed Samhain. 
You know, Samhain is also known as Witch's New Year, and so it's a pagan holiday that kicks off a brand new cycle of the Wheel of the Year. We also have a new moon coming up the day after this airs on November 4th. And gentle reminder, I'm going to be leading an online new moon Scorpio season ritual for Witch Wave Patreon backers on November 4th. That's this Thursday evening, so do join us if you're able. I'm a big fan of the new moon and of new beginnings in general. And I'm embarking on a new beginning myself as Matt and I just closed on a little fixer-upper country house this past week, which is wild and wonderful and intimidating and enchanting all at the same time. We've never really owned anything before, so buying a little piece of property, not to mention a car, which we also had to buy for the first time, is joyful and so fortunate, but it's also making us confront a lot of our anxieties and shadows around money and territory and time and how we communicate about all of it and delegate all of the many tasks that will go into repairing and maintaining this home. And it's a lot. I'm also having to face some very real fear around city driving. I've lived in New York City since 1999 and never owned a car here, and I'm a pretty confident driver as soon as I get outside the city. I grew up in New Jersey after all, so driving is practically in my DNA. But something about the idea of navigating city streets in a car just floods me with anxiety. We also had to confront our literal shadows because on the second night we were in the house, our neighborhood had a power outage. And so we were suddenly plunged into darkness in our strange, new-to-us home while Matt was cooking dinner for us on the electric stove. Lucky for us, one of the few things I brought up with me on this first trip was a ton of candles, and so we ended up having ice cream for dinner by candlelight. But it definitely felt like an initiation into the wilderness, which felt destabilizing at first, but which ultimately also affirmed that we can survive this, we can figure this out together. What's helping with all of this newness is my practice. Doing rituals to cleanse and bless the house and, yes, the car, and giving thanks to my ancestors and to the prior owners of the house and the original occupants of the land and to pay reparations to them via a self-imposed land tax through the Manahatta Fund. All of this has helped me feel more plugged into capital S spirit. The area we're in has lots of deer, so I'm making sure that my lady Artemis has a lot of devotional space in and around the house. And when I was rummaging through the garage, I came across this beautiful old skeleton key. And I have no idea what it's for or where it will lead but it made me feel deeply connected to Hecate and her bewitching magic. And of course, I'll be putting it in a place of honor on my altar as well. It all feels like an extremely potent way to kick off the pagan new year, and I'm deeply grateful for this new chapter and new adventure we're embarking on. And I also invite you to think about what new beginnings in your own life you may want to mark and ritualize and ask for support around this week. Speaking of rituals, I am so pleased to be sharing today's conversation with witch and voodoo priestess Lilith Dorsey. 
Lilith has walked many different paths and has developed an ever-evolving spiritual practice that honors the divine feminine and incorporates the different branches of their family tree. They are such a thoughtful and joyful person to speak with about divinity and identity. And while many of the sacred entities and experiences that Lilith discusses are off limits to me and other uninitiated people, I am so inspired by her lifetime of devotion to learning and creating and digging deeper into her own magical roots. But before we get to that, first let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Witches! A writes, For the most part, I like working with elements and energy. But sometimes I wonder if I want to add a deity to the mix, like Hecate, for example. But I can't imagine myself asking them for favors because I'm afraid to be beholden to them. Or maybe someday I would ask them for help and then regret it. I worry that I would never be able to please them, give them enough offerings, or truly thank them properly. Part of my issue is probably rooted in Catholic upbringing, but also because I've struggled with codependency in the past and am trying to heal from that right now. I know that the simple answer is if I don't want to work with them, I don't have to. But I want to dig into these feelings more and understand why I feel this way and how I can be at peace about it. Maybe it could even be an exercise in healing from codependency at some point, but that feels distant right now. Thanks very much for your thoughts. Hi, A. Thank you for this thoughtful question. I so appreciate your willingness to delve into your own shadow and examine your issues of codependency in both your emotional and spiritual life. And while I'm not equipped to address the specifics of your issues since I'm not a therapist and I also don't know the details of the situations to which you're referring, what I can say is this. My relationship to the deities that I'm connected to is one of deep love and respect, and joy. It is not a contentious relationship. It's not one based on punishment or retribution or even scorekeeping. I treat my deities like I do my most beloved friends. And what that means is I make sure that I put in time and effort and attention to those relationships with the mutual understanding that life happens. I express gratitude and love to my dear friends as often as I can, but yeah, there might be periods of time when one of us or both of us is busy or needs to take a pause from communication for a bit or what have you. But I trust that I have shown them enough love and vice versa that they will not abandon me or punish me if I'm going through one of those periods of time when I need to be less communicative. And I am also committed to showing up and expressing my love and support whenever I can. And to, yeah, sometimes dig deep when I'm able to on those occasions when maybe I just don't really feel like it, but I know it's the right thing to do. So it's a balance, in other words. And I also know that there are times in my dear friendships when I can have long talks on the phone or dinners or visits with those I adore. But during the times when I can't do that or we can't do that, I still will shoot them a quick text or do a little check-in just to let them know that I'm thinking about them. And so it is with the deities I'm in relationship with. Many of you know that Artemis has been my matron deity since I was a teenager, and there are times when I do elaborate rituals for her or take pilgrimages to honor her. But I can't do that all the time, and I think she gets that. She knows that she's still represented on my altar and in the talismans I wear and various other ways that I express my magic and my other creative work. And so I don't feel as if she feels slighted or needs to 
punish me during those times when I'm only able to do those quick check-ins. It would be unreasonable for a beloved friend to require constant attention, and I believe it's unreasonable for any deity to. And if there's a deity who is giving you that vibe, then I'd recommend that you move on to someone who is a better fit for your life and for whatever you are able to give to the relationship. And now look, I know that if you are struggling with some of these dynamics in your human relationships, the words I'm saying right now might seem challenging to act upon or embody. And maybe, ultimately, you will decide that having a deeper relationship with a deity just isn't the right fit for you right now, and that's okay. But I think it's wonderful that you're asking these questions, and I'm truly confident that if you feel called to work with Hecate or anyone else who makes you feel at home, then you're going to figure this out and come up with a good rhythm and develop a relationship together that is loving and magical and mutually respectful of one another's capacity and abilities. I hope that helps, and I look forward to hearing how things develop for you. Now, on to my guest. Lilith Dorsey hails from many magical traditions, including Celtic, Afro-Caribbean, and Native American spirituality. They are the author of many books, including Voodoo and Afro-Caribbean Paganism, The African-American Ritual Cookbook, Love Magic, Water Magic, and their newest book, Orishas, Goddesses, and Voodoo Queens, The Divine Feminine in the African Religious Traditions. Lilith has been a professional psychic for over three decades, and since 1991, they have been doing successful magic and readings for patrons of their business. In addition to all that, they are also the editor and publisher of Oshun African Magical Quarterly and the filmmaker of the experimental documentary, Bodies of Water, Voodoo Identity and Transformation. And this blew my mind. They were also the choreographer for jazz legend Dr. John's Night Tripper Voodoo Show. And you know I asked Lilith all about that. Lilith's formal education focused on plant science, anthropology, and film at the University of Rhode Island, New York University, and the University of London and their magical training includes numerous initiations in Santeria, also known as Lukumi, Haitian Voodoo, and New Orleans Voodoo. Lilith joined me from their home in New Orleans via Zoom. Lilith Dorsey, welcome to the Witch Wave. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to have you here. I've been wanting to speak with you for such a long time. I've been a longtime admirer of yours, so I am so appreciative of you for taking the time. So first, I want to dive into your beautiful name. I assumed that Lilith was a name that you took upon for yourself. There are a lot of witches in our community who have magical names. And I was so delighted to discover that this is actually a name that was granted to you by your parents. And I'd love to hear a little bit about what that was like growing up with such a powerful name and why they chose it for you. It was hard, I think. You know what I mean? I I meet younger millennial Liliths and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, (laughs) and I'm not saying anything against them or anything like that. But she had, especially being my age, you know, I'm not going to give my age. I'm not going to give my daughter's age. But she's long out of college. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) I'm old enough to have had her. And (laughs) 
basically there was a lot of negativity, a lot of stereotypes surrounding Lilith, specifically within the Jewish community. I grew up in New York City. I'm a Brooklyn girl, represent. Mm -hmm. And I think that I initially, when people recognized what it was, that was within the context. And it came with all that misogynistic, you know, demon related (gasps) connotations. So that was another barrier that I never thought. But yes, my parents named me Lilith. They didn't write it down in case anybody's going to try and come after me with the numerology and whatnot. They didn't (laughs) write it down in the hospital. It wasn't on my birth certificate for a very long time because they couldn't decide on a middle name. So Mm. they left the hospital. I was just baby girl. So I'll answer to that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Did they explain why they chose that for you, Lilith? Yeah, I wasn't actually named after the goddess. I was named after the book slash movie, probably more of the movie than the book. So that's a weird connotation. I'm a filmy person. But for those who haven't seen it, it was a Gene Seberg, Warren Beatty thing. And she was this sort of seductress that had mental issues. I mean, it's not a horror movie. It's more of a love story, actually. (laughs) But it does tap into that sort of primal Lilla sensuality, sexuality, and this kind of ancient, you know, goddess vibe that she has. So that's why they named me that. They knew about the goddess. They thought that was really cool, too. You know, I think it was probably the only thing they ever agreed upon. But um, mm, mm. I mean, I can't not talk about my parents without saying they were one of the first interracial couples to be married in New York City. I realized wow. they were married, I think, three weeks after the first couple was married. So I can't even imagine what that was like for them to go down to City Hall and get all of that done. And there was a lot going on there. Wow, how fantastic. I think it's incredible that you were a child named Lilith and then you grew up to become a witch and a voodoo priestess and to write so much about goddesses and feminine magic. Let's talk a little bit about the word witch, because I've tried to be more mindful about the fact that a lot of folks have used the word witch traditionally as a negative epithet to talk about things like voodoo or santeria or all these other practices. So not all practitioners of voodoo consider themselves witches, and yet you are happy to hold both of those identifiers as part of yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that there was such a closed atmosphere. Me growing up in New York City in the 70s, and still today, I wouldn't suggest somebody just walk into a botanica or a voodoo temple and be like, I want to join, I want to learn, because they're going to look at you no matter what race you are, like you're a lunatic, Mm. and throw you out, because that's not really how things are done. You know, it's like walking into somebody's house and saying, I want to join your family. I'm not going to leave. You know, people (laughs) would look at you like WTF, what is happening? So that was very closed for me. And I think, again, a lot of people of my age grew up this way with this is what we do with the salt. This is what we do with the broom. This is what we do when we cook. This is what we do when someone's sick. And there were all these folk magic things really standard issue witchcraft things, which I now know now that I'm an adult and and I studied it academically. You know, there was all these magical things that I was taught growing up, but I didn't even really think of that as magic. I just thought of this is what you do. Mm -hmm. This is the first person who steps into the house on New Year's Eve. This is what you eat on New Year's Day. This is what makes you healthy, happy, wealthy, wise. And When I was a teenager, I kind of, you know, I think a lot of teenagers want to delve into alternative spirituality, especially if it's not what they learned or what they practiced growing up. So I got my tarot cards and me and my best friend used to do little spells and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, she went on to be part of one of the largest covens in New York City and they do open rituals and things like that. So I feel like my roots were in traditional witchcraft. And that's why I call myself a witch, not because I'm sort of rewriting this voodoo African traditional religion. For me, that's not witchcraft. If people want to identify that as witchcraft, Kudos to them. Identify yourself however you want to. But I don't call it witchcraft 
because of the negative stigma that you're talking about, mm-hmm. because so much of anthropology, which I did my undergrad in and my grad in, is based on this sort of negativizing of witches, this othering of witches. And I didn't want to contribute to that in any way. Mm-hmm. And certainly not in an African context or an Afro diasporan context. So were you raised with any kind of African diaspora religion or spirituality? No, no, I didn't come to any of that until I was a late teenager and I joined my voodoo temple here, the voodoo spiritual temple on Rampart Street run by Priestess Miriam. In New Orleans. Yeah, New Orleans. I joined that 29 years ago, a long time. They just had their 30th anniversary. So I've been there, you know, worshiping with them and studying with her since the very beginning. I only found her by accident. It was sort of, I was hippie. I used to follow the dead around and I was doing hippie things. (laughs) And I always wanted to learn voodoo and study voodoo and give it the proper respect that I knew it had. I didn't happen to find that until I was at an event where Priestess Miriam was also doing rituals. And I was just enamored of the entire tradition and had to become part of it in any way possible. So... I find it really interesting. In your biography, you talk about having Afro-Caribbean, Celtic, and Indigenous American threads of spirituality as part of your practice. The reason I'm starting up front with us clarifying this is because I do think there's this real problem in the witchcraft community of people like lumping all of these different things together, especially white people like me who, you know, just out of this hunger for connection, people then think they can just kind of like borrow or mix and match whatever they think resonates with them. And so I just want to really clarify that in your case, these are all practices that you studied for a long time. In some cases, you were initiated into your own background is of mixed race. You know, we're not talking about a human being here who is just kind of like (laughs) picking and choosing from random stuff and mushing it together, right? Definitely. And I do need to clarify that for people. I identify as Black mainly because I was raised with these outmoded ideas of paper bag test. And I had Howard Stern called me a pleasing octoroon once on the radio. (gasps) Are you serious? Yeah, I am Jeez, serious. I, yikes. But for me, it was about honoring the ancestors. And so much of my practice today is honoring the ancestors. So if I have ancestors from those things that for me, it's not appropriation because this is part of who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think that's the definition of appropriation. I've done a lot of workshops about appropriation. Funny over the years, I started doing them maybe five years ago and, and still people want to talk about appropriation. And Probably the third time I did it, and I did it with my friends Roy Jones and a wonderful woman, Fat Mandy, a performer from Pittsburgh. And we stopped talking about cultural appropriation. We started talking about straight up racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what some of this drifts into. And that's what's so offensive to me. When we talk about the ATRs, voodoo and lakumi and condomble, it's not a pick and choose the way some of the European magics are. And that's because we're a continuous tradition. If we look at the Orisha Shango, there's written evidence that it goes back to the fourth century BCE. So we're talking about 400 years before Christ. This has been something that's in place and never fallen out of worship. People have been doing it the same way, pretty much with slight additions over the past, you know, 2000 years, even with the goddess Lilith, that's not something that was a continuous tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was growing up, people didn't know who she was. And now there's been all this reclaiming, both from the Jewish community and the witchcraft community. And that makes me really happy. But I do caution people about doing things the right way, the respectful way. I spent a lot of time around little kids and, you know, they'll go out in the yard and they'll dig up some mud and they'll put some shells or some stones in it. And they'll be like, this is a cake. And it's like, sweetheart, yum, that's delicious. But, you know, that's not a cake. We can't really eat that. And that's what I feel like. They've come and made something up of their own accord. And it's not really healthy to consume that. And Mm. and that's where I'm going with that. Ah, I love that analogy. So let's dive in to your book, Orishas, Goddesses, and Voodoo Queens, The Divine Feminine in the African Religious Traditions. It's such a beautiful book. 
you know, you say at the beginning of the book that there hasn't really been a book quite like this before. So I'd love to hear a little about the inspiration that you had to create it. This was the book I always wanted to write. And I know that sounds like some giant cliche that the interviewed author says, but (laughs) it's true. I did my undergrad at NYU Film, and then I had to leave because I was pregnant, and I had my daughter, and there was no film program where we were living in New England. So I went and got a degree in anthropology, which would have been my second choice. At that time, it was the early 90s, and there was no sort of positive African current in scholarship. There was certainly no positive African stuff out there in witchcraft or media or anything like that. Mm. And I knew that was wrong. You know, a lot of these early pagan or witchy events, drumming was banned, dancing was banned. People would threaten to shut down my rituals or, or, you know, bring weapons to them. In New York City, that happened. It happened in New York State. It happened all over the Northeast, pretty Mm. much. Mm. A little bit in the South as well. You know, it didn't matter where we were. We met with a lot of racism and prejudice and everything like that. And I had a teacher, uh, the head of the anthro department, used to tell me there was no such thing as witchcraft and magic in America. And I was like, you're a bald, white idiot, and I'm going to prove you wrong. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't want my girls growing up like that. I didn't want them thinking that, you know, the fact that they were black was bad. The fact that they were a woman was bad. The fact that they liked to dance or sing or be creative or honor their ancestors was something that was foreign or other or backwards or anything like that. And since I didn't see what I wanted out there, I knew I had to do it myself. So That's when I started writing and and continuing my study and making films and everything about it. It made me so happy once my daughter's anthro teacher, when she was at Cornell, came to her and showed her my book and was like, is this your mom? And she was like, yeah, it is. (laughs) That's so awesome. I'm also grinning because I studied anthropology at NYU. And so, yeah. And so whenever I meet a a sister or a brother or non-gender binary anthropology scholar as well, I get really, really happy. You know, Anthropology, it's such a really interesting, I think, course of study. And I imagine it's evolved even since I graduated, you know, over 20 years ago now. God, I can't believe it's been that long. But, you know, because (laughs) the history of it was like old white dudes studying, quote unquote, the other. And Mm -hmm. it's really evolved, you know, certainly. But, you know, I studied anthropology because I was trying to study essentially witchcraft and the occult. And that was the closest that I got to it. What led you to that path? Again, I think it was exactly the same thing. You know what I mean? And you're right. I was so proud. I mean, I did my undergrad in anthro at URI. And then I did my grad in NYU's culture and media program. So that's half film cinema studies and half anthro and I went back we had these cultural media reunions and I went back and there was such a shift to making this be the authentic voice and that made me so proud you know like I got my grad in I don't want to say 2004 2005 you know and there was still even then challenging within the department about can you do this in your voice can you do this as a practitioner can you do this and be representative of the actual experience, Mm -hmm. you know, in film or with the written word. And just going back, it almost completely flipped the script. It certainly wasn't full of, you know, BIPOC women and non-gender people, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah. (laughs) when I first went to NYU, I was there, I think the year after Spike Lee left. And I looked around in my freshman film class and like me and M. Night Shyamalan were the only people of color in the entire 400 people audience. I can only imagine. uh, I certainly was the only black woman. I could tell you that. Mm -hmm. You know, so just the fact that we have representation and we can tell our own stories is something that I think is beautiful because, again, that's what matters to me. Have it be this authentic voice. Gorgeous. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Vera Meat. Vera Meat creates divinely weird and whimsical jewelry for those with unusual taste. 
Her pop-a-culture talismans are playful and stylish, like her talk-to-the-witch hand palmistry ring, vampire luck golden fang necklace, and her brand new tarot collection, which allows you now to adorn yourself in meaningful, magical tarot card imagery. Vera Meat also uses healing, supportive stones in her pieces, like garnet, and black sapphire. She's also got apparel and accessories covered in moons, runes, and witchy babes. And Witchwave listeners can use code WITCHWAVE for 60% off orders on verameat.com through January 2022. You heard that right. You get 60. That's 60% off using offer code WITCHWAVE all one word, at veramate.com. That's V-E-R-A-M as in magic, E-A-T dot com. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by the Many Moons Lunar Planner. The always highly anticipated cult classic spiritual field guide to 2022 is back. This unique resource for magic, expansion, and introspection has dozens of rituals, spells, tarot spreads, and essays for each new and full moon. With a variety of esteemed practitioners included, such as Lama Rod Owens, Fariha Royson, and creator and prior Witch Wave guest, Sarah Faith Godestiner, this planner helps you get organized and stay organized practically and magically. Track your moods, your tarot pulls, and your appointments all in the same place. Make magic every day with the 2022 Many Moons Lunar Planner. I adore this planner and I know you will too. So go on ahead and order it at modernwomenprojects.com or by clicking the link in the show notes. That's the Many Moons Lunar Planner at modernwomenprojects.com. I am a big fan of therapy and have seen firsthand how much talking to a professional has helped me manage my own anxiety and stress and trauma so that I can live the fullest life I possibly can. I've also seen how it's changed the lives of so many people that I care about for the better as well. And that's why I am encouraging you to check out Better Help which is an online counseling service that can provide you with your own licensed professional counselor to talk to via video or phone sessions. And it doesn't have to be that heavy of a topic. Maybe you just need a place to be heard and have an outside perspective on your everyday struggles with your job or your relationships. We all have so much that we're carrying with us these days between our personal issues and, need I say, global issues, and it's just a lot. And I'm telling you, talking it all through with someone who is trained and objective and not a friend or family member is such a gift because their job Their actual job is to listen to you and help you work through your feelings about it all. So please consider reaching out to the folks at BetterHelp, and they'll connect you with a counselor who you can start chatting with in under 24 hours. And they've been doing remote sessions since before it became the norm, so they've built a platform that's accessible, convenient, and secure. Also know that BetterHelp offers financial aid to those who qualify, and they make it really easy to switch counselors so you can find one that you truly click with. Best of all, Witchwave listeners get 10% off your first month of counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash witchwave. Please take care of your mental well-being. It is so necessary, and there is absolutely support out there for you. Do what over a million people have done already, and head on over to betterhelp.com slash witchwave, find a great counselor to talk to, and know that I am here rooting for you. Feel well, 
and take good care with better help. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Lilith Dorsey. So Lilith, we're talking about your beautiful book, Orisha's Goddesses and Voodoo Queens. And I'd love for you to dive into more of the meat of the book. Every chapter focuses on a different Orisha. And actually, maybe that's a good place to start. For listeners who might not be as familiar with some of the African diaspora traditions, would you mind giving us just like basic terminology? And I'm sure it's exhausting to have to do this often. So as quick and easy as you want to go, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I wish I had an easier answer. I mean, Orisha is what the, I don't even like to say divinities because some people are also still practicing Christians and they don't like that comparison. And, you know, they're the divine beings. They're the sacred beings in the religions of La Regla La Cumi, which people more commonly know as Santeria and Candomblé and things like that. It's a slightly different spelling. They're called Arisha in among the Yoruba people in Africa where they practice Ifa. The energies are similar, but also very different from the way it is practiced in Haiti and Haitian Vodou. They're called Loa. And linguistically, we're not really sure what Loa means. It, it's, again, Haitian Creole is very, you know, suppressed for so long and now it's hard to actually pack out what the truth is. But again, it means sanctified being. And Orisha comes from Ori, which is the Yoruba word for head and shahs the root word for ashe which is our sacred energy so it's like the sacred energy of your head Mm. and your guiding force your kind of guardian angel i think some people explain it as but again i would also see people not wanting to explain it that way it's it's, i don't want to be disrespectful to anybody but i've heard it explained that way by several different people when you're writing about each of these maybe i'll call them divine presences does that feel right to you or cosmic forces yeah I have a decent working knowledge of different traditions, but it it seems to me like you're writing about different cosmic forces from different traditions all within this same book. That's right? Yes, definitely. So, for example, like Oshun comes from a different tradition than Urzuli. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because I, I think sometimes people think that they hear some of the more popular names and they think that's all from one kind of monolithic tradition. And that is not true. I invite you to clarify anything or any misconceptions that people might have when they're approaching this yeah. book. They're not the same. I mean, I think people have the same monolithic idea about Africa. The people that were enslaved and forced to leave went to all these different places. And in each one of those, it was informed by the indigenous people. It was informed by the experience. It was informed by the spirits of place where they landed or where they came from. We're talking about lots of different tribes and things like that. But somebody wanted me to make a map once of like, oh, this people came here and went there. You know, records are shoddy. There is no one. This is exactly what happened. But when we talk about the Orisha or the Loa or the religions of Ifa or Kendomble, we're talking about West Africa. You know, we're talking about the Yoruba people. We're talking about the people in Benin. We're talking about the people in Nigeria. And because of the way the Middle Passage happened, that's where a lot of people left from. Then they were brought primarily to Brazil and other temporary spots in the Caribbean and South America. And then they were distributed throughout the Caribbean and and North America and everywhere else that they had enslaved African people. So it's different here in New Orleans. It makes it even more confusing because there are some strictly Haitian Vodou type temples. There are some strictly La Regla La Cumi or Santeria houses. There are ones like mine that include both. And the same way, I'm glad you made that clarification about me. I'm not being a dilettante. We were (laughs) not a dilettante and picking from one and taking from another when the Buddhist spiritual temple is started. Obviously, Priestess Miriam could do a much better job of explaining this than I could. But to give some clarity to the situation, when we started, we had three well, four main temple drummers, Priest Ashwan, who's no longer with us. And then there were three Luises drumming. There was Louise Martinet, who's the author of the New Orleans Voodoo Tarot, along with Sally Ann Glassman, who's a mambo here in the city. And Luis Nunez, who wrote a book called Santeria, and another guy named Luis. Now, two of the Luises, Luis, Luis, and Luis, two of the Luises <laughs> were Santeros, 
And Luis Martinet is a drummer. Obviously, they're all drummers, but he was very into the researching of different rhythm, the way jazz is, finding commonalities between rhythms and incorporating some of those rhythms into the services that we did here. Sorry, in Orleans. what does Santero mean? A uh, Santero is a Santeria priest. Sure. Okay. So it comes with the initiation where you get the Arisha permanently placed on your head. They call it seated or elevated. Mm. I mean, that's what it translates to. Mm. So it's like you are a functioning priest where you can do ceremonies yourself. There's, you know, things like that. You know, it's the first real priest priestess kind of initiation that happens Thank in that you. tradition. Thank you. So getting back to your book, I'm coming into this book as very much an outsider. And yet when I'm reading it, I'm so inspired. I think these stories and these paths are so beautiful. And yet I have learned that this most likely then, these are stories or symbols that I might be able to fall in love with, but that does not give me permission to maybe start a relationship with these deities. Is it, would you agree with that? Or And again, I know you're not speaking for every voodoo priestess in the world, but I would love to hear your thoughts on how a reader like myself, who is not initiated and not black or, you know, from, from any of these paths might engage with this material and maybe just reading it and being educated is enough and being inspired as opposed to then feeling like, oh, now I'm going to put, you know, an Oshun on my altar or what have you. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for me, I think it depends on what somebody defines relationship as mm -hmm. you know i've heard of people doing some really disrespectful things in relationships with their divinities things that are different than what we practice and for me i think that we've got to talk about the concept of ashe which i mentioned before which is the sort of universal life force or energy each of the orisha have sacred ashe if we talk about somebody like oshun that's the ashe of the river. So she's simultaneously river water and also everything we give to offer her, like sunflowers and honey and amber and all these other things. And she's present in all of those things, which is not a Western concept. So I think this is where we need to start. So I think it's okay if somebody who is non-BIPOC wants to understand it and celebrate her Ashe on a very beginning level. Again, like I said, moving into somebody's house. She don't necessarily want to move into your house, so don't get the <laughs> statue, don't set up the altar. Certainly don't start asking her for things. I've known a lot of misinformed witches that went out and was like, oh, I threw a coral necklace into the Hudson River. How come she didn't give me a boyfriend? That's not how it's done. Mm. You know, like I mentioned, there's thousands of years of how this is done. So if you're interested in moving forward, I suggest you get a reading. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a reading from me. If you run into somebody who's a Santero or a Santera or practicing one of these traditions, ask them, where do they go to get a reading? Find out if it's right for you to move forward in the tradition, because there is a small percentage of white people who are in the tradition mm -hmm. and they have their spiritual family and they practice with their spiritual family and they're part of that. The same way that people sort of get adopted into different families. That's what happens. But you don't just knock on the door and move in. Right. So I think that we need to be respectful. And, and that's where I draw the line really with cultural appropriation to me. It's not oh, okay, I found out about Oshun yesterday. Now I'm teaching a workshop about Oshun today yeah. and I'm writing a book about Oshun and I'm pocketing all this money. And that's not how it's done, you know? So find out how it's done, learn more about how it's done. I think, like you said, reading is a good way to start talking to people. I have my own spiritual house. We practice New Orleans voodoo. If somebody wants to join, I give them a reading. I tell them to talk to the other people in the house. Are you going to be somebody who fits in with us? Are you going to be somebody who understands who we are and how we worship? And are you capable of doing the things that need to be done? So it's not about, oh, I made up that I give her this candle on Tuesday. It's about, can you show up and do what you need for the community? It's a community-based religion. There's no solo nothing. Exactly. And to clarify as well, it's a religion of initiation 
invitation, you know, to your earlier point, if someone were to put, you know, an Oshun statue on their altar, I don't know if that's hurting anybody, but it is definitely not practicing her path. And it's definitely not, you know, being initiated into those traditions, right? Yeah, like I said, there's no self-initiation. I mean, if you were going to have the statue in a respectful way, that for us would be in a room where no intimate physical stuff happens. There's taboos against menstruating females, so they would need to be kept away from it. It would need to be given certain offerings at certain times. All these things, Mm -hmm. it's very detailed. So if you're willing to go to the lengths that it takes in order to honor it properly and get the proper guidance from people, then, hey, have at it. You know, I'm not going to be anybody to yuck anybody's yum, as the kids say. (laughs) You know, if you want to do it, if you feel like this is what's supposed to happen, then that's great. But that's determined by initiation readings and divination by multiple priests and priestesses in the tradition, not even just one. So you had a dream about it, or you feel connected, or you feel good at the river does not necessarily mean that you're an Oshun and now you can go out and do what you want. Exactly. No matter what race you are. Exactly. So this book, just to clarify, I cannot encourage anybody more to go read it because it is so beautiful. But this just reading this book is then not going to be the permission slip that you have to start doing these practices. Let's talk about some of these beautiful cosmic forces that you write about. Is there one in particular that you feel called to bring into our conversation today? Somebody whose energy just feels like you are resonating with in particular in this moment who you'd like to share? Well, I'm a daughter of Oshun, which was determined by divination, but <laughs> my La Regla Lakumi Santeria house is was led by an Oshun. We had a disproportionate number of Oshuns in our house. So <laughs> and Oshun gets real jealous when you don't talk about her. So let's talk about Oshun. <laughs> Please, let's do it. And she already made herself known. So yeah, she's right? coming through strong. Yeah, yeah. As I mentioned, she's the Ashe of the river. She's that sacred energy and She is also in charge of love and beauty and money and fertility. And I think a lot of people gravitate towards her because those are beautiful things. And she's so beautiful. And her power really, for me, is the essence of that divine feminine in a way that is not misogynistic. And what I mean by that is her power lies in her sensuality and her beauty, and she can use that to get what she needs out of the situation. There's a sacred story, also known as a pateki, that is told about her where, you know, there were menstruating women and they were angry and they were trying to take over the world and nobody could convince them to stop. They sent (laughs) Ogun with his machete and he tried to fight them and they were like, you know, later for you, screw you. You know, we're more powerful because that, as we all know, that's a very powerful time for women when they're menstruating. And then, you know, other Orisha came and tried to stop them. And then finally, Oshun came and she sang and she danced and she put honey on her hips. And they thought she was so beautiful that they wanted to follow her. And they were called, technically, if you look in the literature, they were called brujas or witches. So these witches that were trying to take over the world, negative connotation, unfortunately, (laughs) then became the domain of Oshun. So that they were calmed in her beauty and in her, you know, sacred rhythm and her sweetness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think that is a power of divine feminine that has been suppressed for so long and taken advantage of for so long that people don't see that anymore. And she sort of does her best to remind us of that in a lot of different ways. Oh, I love that. The idea of beauty as a balm. Mm-hmm. Gorgeous. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by The Path 365. The Path 365 Daily Direction for Ladies and Mothers, Witches and Others is a book that allows you to open your mind, body, and spirit to a path that is uniquely yours. As a gateway spirituality guide, it weaves coping mechanisms identified in neuroscience and mental health that address mind, body, and spirit and incorporates them into an easy-to-read daily guide. It gently encourages people to open their mind to a spiritual path of their own. 
like a daily oracle read for the soul. The Path 365 takes you through a journey of positive self-discovery and encourages you to incorporate your practice into every aspect of your being. Author Susie Newell received her doctorate from the University of Cincinnati, focusing on coping mechanisms for women with substance use disorder. She took these coping mechanisms a step further, offering them to everyone, whether you have a diagnosis or not. So whether you have a solid spiritual practice or are exploring your options, The Path 365 is a unique guide to creating a path of your own. Visit The Path 365 for more details, evidence, and ordering options. Would you like even more Witch Wave? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards also include magical merch and giveaways, early heads up about my workshops before they sell out, and all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly rituals and video chats, and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witches. So head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thanks so much. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Lilith Dorsey. So Lilith, we were talking about Oshun, which related to beauty and love and sensuality. And that reminds me that you wrote an entire book on love magic. I imagine that is one of your more popular books. And I would love to hear anything you feel called to share around maybe what love magic can and can't do or love spells can and can't do. I wish it was one of my more popular books because I think my message in the book was that love magic needs to come from a place of respect. It needs to come from a place of consent and it needs to come from a place of self-love. And as they say here in New Orleans, ain't nobody trying to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, no, I just want to like put a net over someone and drag them into my cave. The end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and right after that book came out, I had all these psychic clients that would come to me and they'd want to do this and they'd want to do that. And they'd say, well, what usually happens? And I would say, well, you usually get exactly what you're asking for and then you don't want it. That's the trap. You know, I mean, if there's an issue with your relationship, there's things you can do to fix it. There's a lot of spells in that book for communication. There's spells in that book for harmony. There's spells in that book for leaving the rest of the world out outside the door before you come into your home and, you know, nurture your own relationship that's in there and those kinds of things. But people, again, just want to lock somebody up and that can be a dangerous trap. You know, what I tell people to look for is the best person for them and drawing that to them. And so, yeah, that may be, you know, whatever schmo you've got down the street <laughs> <laughs> that you have a crush on. Or it could be somebody better. Maybe that person's going to be dead in a week. Maybe that person's going to be abusive. Maybe they're broke. Maybe they smell. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And you don't know either. Yeah. You don't know what's out there. So allowing the universe to bring the best person for you to you really sets the stage for what you're supposed to get. And more importantly, what you need in that moment to grow and thrive and flourish and be your best self. So yes. that's what I focus on a lot in the book. And like I said, I think that I wish more people would listen to it and I wish more people would hear it, you know, and, and things happen in their own time too. I was reminded that this morning, somebody was talking about, oh, you know, sometimes the universe's time takes not months, but years. And I was looking at the post and the girl was like half my age. And I was like, when you get to this age, you realize sometimes it takes decades, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'm so happy to have you just reiterate that stance because I think it's so, so true. I mean, I'm a testament to that. When I was 
a 20 something year old and I was fantasizing about my dream person and writing my little checklist of stuff. It was so much about a projection of my own ego. You know, I wanted basically like the male version of me, which please would not have been good for me. And I'm, I feel so grateful that I was actually more open to love coming in whatever form was right for me. Cause I'll tell you what I, Listeners know I'm very blessed. I have a very happy marriage. We've had lots of ups and downs, but I have this incredible partner, but he is really different than I might have fantasized about when I was in my 20s, which isn't to say he's not fantasy worthy because he's a dream, obviously. He is a playwright, which is wonderful. He's creative, but he's also like obsessed with professional wrestling and, you know, has all kinds of weird quirks (laughs) and things that I would never have thought would be part of my life. And now I'm like, I sometimes watch wrestling too now. I mean, I'm being very, you know, glib, but we don't always know what is best for us. And being open to whatever form love takes, I think, is absolutely right on. So thank you for that message. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having an inspirational relationship. I think that that is something that people don't see very often, you know. And I'm glad you celebrate that. And it makes me happy. I see your posts and I'm like, yay. (laughs) (laughs) But but it's not all sunshine and roses. We definitely have had difficult times. And I think it's important people know that too. But he's a real sweetheart. I'm very, very blessed. But I think it's really right on for people to focus on the intention of the love spell and not a specific target. Not, oh, I want that person. But rather... I want the person who is best for me, exactly as you said. I think that's so right on. And for those who might feel called to do some kind of love spell, is there any basic spell that you recommend for people or does it really vary from situation to situation? It does vary, but I do usually recommend that people do spells on their bed. People do spells on their home. And what do I mean by that? Make yourself like a love spray. Put that in your bed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like make yourself a love bath, take a bath in it, make some sort of love attraction thing for your home. Again, not putting it on something specific, but that you're trying to attract that best person to you. Obviously you want them in your, well, not obviously you want, if you want them in your bed, do the attraction for your bed. You don't want them (laughs) in your bed, just do the attraction for the home. But I will give one caveat. I had a a former best friend who used to put on love stuff and then she'd go visit her partner and she'd have to go through Penn Station, which us New Yorkers know is where all the trains leave to go like local. So all these like homeless people would be rubbing up on her because she was covered in attraction oil. So (laughs) she realized, wait a minute, I shouldn't go in this really busy place if I'm going to (laughs) be covered in attraction oil and have stuff in her pocket and her underwear and her bra and all of this, you know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You want to be thoughtful about Mm -hmm. just when you're getting into that flow of that juicy energy where you are emanating all of that and when. Yeah, she should have waited until she arrived where she was going and maybe and done it then. Oh, my goodness. And so speaking of juicy energy and flowing energy, and I suppose this loops us back to Oshun as well, you wrote and edited another book called Water Magic. And it's interesting because I caught, I believe it was in your Orisha's book, you saying something to the effect of how much you love fire magic. And yet it seems like something keeps calling you back to water. So how did the water magic book come to be? I was asked by my editor, Heather Green, who has her own new book out. Yay, Heather. She was just on the podcast. Yes, author of Light (laughs) Camera Witchcraft. Yeah, yeah. And she is my editor at Llewellyn, and she wanted to do a series about the elements. And the first one was going to be water, and she thought about me. I was confused, really, because... (laughs) You're like, I'm a fire witch, damn it. I know. I was like, what? I'm an Aries with a Libra rising and a Libra moon. Like, it's all fire and air over here. There's no (laughs) water anywhere. But I started thinking about it more and I started thinking about I'm a daughter of Oshun. I grew up in Brooklyn, which my good friend who's a Babalawa, which is a high priest in uh, Ifa and Santeria, told me when we were going to visit his Babalawa's house and we're driving over the Veranzano, which I grew up within walking distance of, that this is where the river starts to meet the ocean. And I was like, 
oh my gosh, I grew up there my whole life. And I never had that aha moment about like, this is the sacred energy of those two things coming mm. together, you know? And now I live in New Orleans and we are right next to the canal and within walking distance of the Mississippi and within a half hour of the lake and an hour from the Gulf. And so here I am again in between all this water, you know? So I feel like I understand water on a deep level. Water is also has this connection traditionally with the ancestors and the afterlife, which a huge amount of my practice is based on. So when she came to me and said she was thinking about it, I was happy and honored and I figured I could do it. It was fun for me. As an anthropologist, I pretty much gathered everything there was to say about water magic and put it in that book. So there's crystals, there's tarot, there's herbs, there's sacred legends from all over the globe. There's sacred legends from actual places that you can visit with sacred sites, which unfortunately, you know, now in the plague times, mm. <laughs> I couldn't get to visit as many as I like, but there's also stuff about, you know, sacred water in your home, like sacred water, that's rainwater, tap water, how to use all of these things magically in a way that resonates with that energy of water. Yeah, I'm a total bath witch. So anything that has to do with bath spells or meditations in the bath, anything is something that really, really appeals to me. And so when I was reading a lot of different segments of that book, I was just like, yes, yes, I have to incorporate all of this. It's my magic. It's, it's a wonderful book and really comprehensive. And you have quite a few other writers in the book as well. Yeah, that was since I was the first, you know, it was extra lucky and fortunate for me because I got to sort of shape how the series went because I was the first one and I was like, oh, well, there needs to be all these other things from other people writing about it because I'm just one person. I don't understand the sacred water of Niagara Falls, which my dear friend, which Dr. Utu has the piece in the book and they have a voodoo practice up there. They have a sacred drum group, the Dragon Ritual Drummers. They've been doing rituals there with Niagara Falls since I've known him, which is over 20 years now. So I wanted him to have a piece in the book. My dear friend, Fat Mandy, who I mentioned, does sacred water things in Pittsburgh and talks about the sacred waters there. There's an indigenous piece by my friend Miguel Sage, who's a Taino elder. I wanted to have that piece. And there's a piece by my friend Alison Eggleston, who's a linguist. So I really wanted that to be in there too, linguistically, to talk about that kind of stuff. I love that uh, section where you talk about the derivation of the word water, or, or they yes. talk about the derivation of the word water. Yes. Yeah. It was beautiful. I wanted to incorporate so much of what was happening. And now I forgot to mention Jason Winslade, PhD, occult scholar, who also has a piece in the book about ocean. <laughs> so there's just so many other ways of approaching the water, so many other interactions of it. And I wanted their voices to be included as well. And I wanted to be able to share that with people. And I could write it, sure. But, you know, since Allison has her PhD in linguistics, I thought it was better if she wrote it. So <laughs> yeah. that's what happened. <laughs> it is such a splendid book. I really recommend it. And then other authors have gone on to do other books in the series for each element or other editors, I should say. It's a really wonderful series. And your book is absolutely magnificent. Lilith, we just have a few more minutes, but I would be remiss if I did not ask you about Dr. John, because... <laughs> I'm a huge fan of his music. May he rest in peace and power. I had no idea you had this deep relationship with him. Can you speak in our final moments a little bit about how you met him and what kind of work you did together? Oh, my gosh. You're going to make me teary. Um, oh, <laughs> we like to I leave people Dr. on a John. teary low. <laughs> I love Which Dr. Ways. John. And, and for so, I mean, I did workshops for years where I would talk about the original Dr. John, Dr. John Montanay here in New Orleans, and then the jazz musician, Dr. John. Luckily, I was fortunate enough. I was contacted by a dear friend of mine who was working with him and partnered with him. And she said, do you know anybody who can do the old New Orleans voodoo dances from like Marie Laveau's time? Mm. You know, Dr. John Mack is putting together this, you know, Night Tripper Voodoo show. It's the resurgence of the show he used to do back in the 70s. Mm. 
and they told me they couldn't get in touch with the dancer. I did have somebody call in once to a show I was on and be like, I'm the dancer. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. They said they tried to look for you. I didn't, I'm not trying to take your job. But <laughs> they said they couldn't find the dancer. And I thought about it for a minute. And, you know, my thing, in addition to being film, was always sacred dance on film. I'm a dancer. I love dancing. And I thought about it for a minute. And I went, hey, maybe I can do it. That's my advice to everybody out there. If you can do a job and somebody asks you, do you know anybody who can do the job? Say, uh, maybe I can do it. Yeah, me, <laughs> me. So I had a conversation with Mac. It was beautiful. He said, what are these dances about to you? And I said, they're about joy and resistance. And he's like, that's beautiful. And mm -hmm. I went and auditioned for him. And he said to me, again, this is all in good fun. I'm not saying anything. He said to me, well, I don't care what you do as long as all your clothes come off. So I went, huh. <laughs> mm. And I've been known to go clothing optional. But at that point, I had two kids. And I was like, I don't know if anybody want to see that. You know? <laughs> I talked to the manager and I went, his name's Peter. I was like, Peter, should I I'll take my clothes off? Because we were going to do Bonnaroo was the first show we were going to do. So should I get up at Bonnaroo in front of 10,000 people and take my clothes off? And they're like, no, Vice is going to shut us down. Keep your clothes on. It sounds like you were a fan of his. Was any part of you like, oh, that's a little unsavory, oh, no, Dr. John. It didn't feel like no, that to you? Okay. Not at all. I wasn't grossed out or creeped out or I didn't feel offended or anything. I've been around a lot of old jazz men and it's all very raunchy and salacious and I'm fine with that. I, mm -hmm. I grew up in Brooklyn. I curse like a sailor. I've done a lot of clothing optional events. I don't have any problem. <laughs> yeah. And you felt comfortable saying no if you wanted to. Yeah. No, of course. I would have felt like I could have said no. And I honestly was just like, I don't think anybody wants to see it. I mean, if, even at the time I was doing workshops on ritual and performance about this is going to be at Bonnaroo. It's going to be in front of 20,000 people and it's going to be a performance. It's hard to do a ritual with 20,000 people yeah. who think they're at a music festival. Exactly. So I knew that it was going to be primarily a performance. And if that was the gig, you know, I would decide whether or not I wanted the gig. But no, we became friends. I did a lot of shows after Bonnaroo. I did a Jazz Fest show with him. I went oh. on the road with him. I joined him in Brooklyn at, for a show in Williamsburg, which people can see on YouTube if they want. I joined him for all the shows at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which was great. Mm. Three generations of my family been on that stage, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which was so blessed to me oh, to that's know incredible. that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. So, but he was like a dad to me. He really was. Like, he always put a smile on my face. So I said, I'm going to cry. He always, my own dad was really kind of crappy. And Mac was always so sweet to me and so kind and so generous, which, you know, I know he had to have good boundaries because he was a professional person, but I always felt welcome. You, you want to sleep on my bed? You want to take pictures? <laughs> when I'm not there, obviously. Uh, yeah. <laughs> good, good point of clarity. <laughs> no, it wasn't like that between us. You know, like he really was like my second dad. Totally. Totally. Oh, he gorgeous. gave me great advice. And about the book, he always used to say, you know, he's like, like your dancing is beautiful, but writing these books is what's important. And that's why I dedicated the Arisha's book to him because he's like, this is going to live on. You know what I mean? Performance is performance and it lasts in the fleeting moment and, you know, writing it down and, and trying to really change people's minds about the truth of the religion. He understood how important that was. And for me to hear, you know, we went to his memorial and uh, one of the Neville brothers got up and st on stage and said, there would not be black and white musicians on stage today in America if it wasn't for Dr. John, you know, really? and yeah, definitely. He fought for having his black musicians on stage. And then I remember they used to tell me stories about having to go through the back door and Mac fighting for their rights, you know, and, and making sure that they were included. And it was so beautiful to me that this is who he was. And he did such amazing things for people and, and for voodoo as well. I mean, I think back in the seventies, when he started, we didn't really have this public voodoo persona that was positive. We just had things that were, you know, racist yeah. and extreme. All those stereotypes of like the witch doctors and voodoo priests who were yes. supposed to be demonic and evil. We still have those tropes on TV today. Of course, you know, so, but I think a lot of what he was doing was about reclaiming some of that, or reclaiming what he was taught, you know? I mean, he used to share with me a lot of the magic that he used to practice and I used to 
he used to, you know, consult with me about things that he was doing and stuff like that. And and it was always entertaining. That's what I have to say. I mean, <laughs> there's stories about my friend coming back to where we were staying and he's got frog's legs on the ceiling from making gumbo. And, and you know, oh he would call goodness. me up and he'd be like, I stole this woman's underwear. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> That's really illuminating because I'm a big fan of his music. I especially love the Gree Gree album is, I think, one of the most amazing albums oh, yeah. across genre in history. Just such a powerful, oh, yeah. magical album. But I have to confess, I didn't realize he considered himself a practitioner. Oh, yeah. Was he an initiate as well? He was an initiate in several of the voodoo houses here in New Orleans. And also he had ties to Santeria and uh, FNF Botanica, which unfortunately Felix the owner died right around when Mac did, actually. Mm. And uh, it's closed. But he also had a Santeria connection through Felix and the work that he did there. I went there with him, you know, so he definitely was a practitioner. I, I Like I said, I stayed in his house. He had altars. He had lots of sacred things going on, you know. Mm. I was fortunate enough to be able to say goodbye and be able to attend his memorial. And that was beautiful as well. Mm. Well, what a blessing that your paths crossed. And I feel so grateful that our paths have finally crossed, Lilith. Yes. So last question. If people want to get in touch with you, whether to have a reading by you or to access more of your work, what is the best place for them to find you? They can check out my website, LilithDorsey.com. I'm on social media. They can find me there. They can find my blog, Voodoo Universe, which is 700 posts about voodoo and the ATRs and herbs and media and everything else I do. <laughs> How fabulous. Well, I could speak to you for a hundred more hours. I hope this is the <laughs> yes. first of many future conversations. And Yay. thank you so much for being here, Lilith. It was such a pleasure getting to speak with you. Oh, thank you so much. And I can't wait to talk some more. This has been a joy. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Lilith Dorsey for sharing their fiery spirit and watery wisdom with me. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on The Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is a phantasmophile production written and produced by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was recorded and edited by Josh Wilcox and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and I by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Laura Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now by Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really, truly makes a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchwavePod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider ordering my book, Witchcraft, or picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave or you would just like to support the show, please join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.